The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Barrio, Little Mexico, East Los Angeles, Sal Si Puedes. Here is where Chicanos live, brought together initially by segregation and later by their own search for cultural affinity and reinforcement. Here in the Barrio, beyond the facades of dilapidated housing, empty lots, cut-rate stores and dusty streets, there is a world of tight-knit families, warmth and friendship. There is also poverty, lack of opportunity and despair. In a not too distant past, to get out of the barrio and become assimilated into the big American melting pot was a sought after goal, not very easily accomplished by Chicanos in this land of upward mobility. Today, things are different. There is a movement that points towards the barrio. If you have left, return. If you are still there, stay. Realize your own potential. Be proud of your biculturalism and help build a better present and a much better future for all the people in the barrio. Dr. Manuel Ramirez of the University of California, Riverside, will discuss some aspects of barrio life and cultural democracy. The educational programs in our schools have been operating under the Anglo cultural superiority philosophy. Although this has worked successfully in persuading other ethnic groups to abandon their cultural heritage, the Mexican-American has retained his because his culture is an integral part of the Southwest. His culture was here long before people of other groups came to the Southwest. The melting pot philosophy as applied to education has ignored these facts, thus producing negative results. First, the Chicano child becomes confused by the exclusion of Mexican, Mexican culture from the classroom. It is completely different from the learning experiences and cultural back background of his preschool life. His parents, too, are confused by the lack of understanding of Anglo teachers concerning the values of Mexican-American life. The second result is a conclusion by Anglo educators that Mexican-American culture and experiences in the barrio are a hindrance to the child's ability to learn and therefore must be done away with rather than preserved. They have not recognized that even though there is poverty in the barrio, there is also much warmth and personal concern for the well-being of others, as well as that there is a Mexican-American culture represented there, which is important to the Chicano. Such a philosophy has had serious negative consequences for the Mexican-American child and his parents. The confusion of the child leads him into a self-defeating cycle of frustration and failure. Instead of reinforcing his values, the educational system forces him into a pattern of hopeless confusion and despair. The consequence of all this is that some give up, contributing to the astronomical dropout rate rates among Chicano students that have soared to 50 and 80 percent before completing high school. Another consequence of this has been an identity crisis, an inability to decide whether or not to maintain his loyalty to Chicano culture. At home, the Chicano child and his parents are usually very much identified with Mexican or Mexican-American values, whereas the school is usually representative of the value system of the Anglo culture. Since the cultures and peoples of the barrio have not been allowed to participate in the educational process, this has resulted in a separation of the two worlds in which the Chicano child as a bicultural person must participate. These two worlds vie for the child's loyalty. At school, the message goes somewhat like this. If you do not reject the Mexican-American culture, you cannot succeed. In the barrios, the appeal is different. If you become anglicized, you are a traitor. 
You come to feel that you are too good for your people. The Chicano child is thus caught between two worlds, and he feels forced to make a choice between parents and teachers, between Chicano peers and Anglo peers. Many children come to feel that in order to succeed in school, they must reject their Chicano identity. When he is questioned about his surname, the person who is feeling the self-rejection syndrome may say that he is Spanish, Italian, or Latin American. Consequently, parents, former friends, and relatives may become symbols of embarrassment because they represent the world which the child has been forced into wanting to reject and forget. Thus, in the process of rejecting barrio culture, the Chicano rejects part of himself. Because of this, he may come into conflict with parents and other relatives at home. This results in considerable guilt, and since the individual does not recognize that it is really the majority society which has forced him to reject himself, he feels responsible and begun, begins to cut him to himself with a psychological scalpel. Often he punishes himself by turning to alcohols, drugs, or he may become depressed. Rarely does the Chicano realize that it is an oppressive society which is responsible for his many problems rather than his inadequacies as a person. But all this is in the past as the Chicano is reborn and tempered in the fires of controversy. In recent years, the Chicano civil rights movement has had a very psychologically healthy effect on Chicano youth. Dramatic methods have recently been employed by Chicano leaders to bring the aforementioned shameful situation to the attention of the general public. Employing the time-honored American tradition of dissent within democracy, the boycott of California and Texas schools by Chicano leaders, parents, and students was one step in the process of establishing more effective methods to secure for the Chicano a position of identity and dignity for himself and his culture. This has created a new man with a new identity and dignity. This new man defies the idea that one cannot be successfully identified with two cultures at the same time. But it's more important, he rejects the claims of the old melting pot philosophy that Chicano culture is inferior to Anglo culture. He insists that the system must change to become responsive to the needs of the barrio and to incorporate the positive aspects of barrio life. He realizes the beauty of his Mexican heritage and his barrio culture. He is able to choose the best of two worlds without feeling that he must reject one or the other. There are three types of personalities which reflect the new identity of, Chica of the Chicano. The Bato, the committed college student, and the Chicana. The Bato is very much identified with barrio culture. Most Batos have dropped out of school because of their unwillingness to give up their Chicanismo. They have resisted attempts of the majority society to convince them that being Chicano is inferior. They have survived harassment by police and other forms of discrimination as well. They are hardened veterans of the daily struggles in the barrio. They are also leaders who, unlike the crazies, serve as adult models for Chicano youth who get into trouble because of drugs or conflicts with their parents. The Bato is thus at the same time a psychotherapist and a teacher. Drawing from their experience, most Batos have developed a philosophy of life in the barrio that is both commonsensical and utilitarian. They change and improve conditions of life within the barrio without fear of reprisals from the establishment. One of these dedicated Chicanos is with us today to answer some further questions about the work of the Batos. His name is Paul Bocanegra. Paul, could you tell us about some of the work that you have been doing in the San Bernardino community? Well, in San Bernardino, we're working with the youth, uh, working with the workers of the community, uh, with bikers. Um, I guess most people understand what a hell angel is, uh, this type of biker. Uh, uh, some clicas, which are gangs, uh, mothers, fathers, uh, brown berets. And, well, <coughs> what is the object of your work, Paul? What is, what is being done by uh, these groups? Uh, the, our purpose is uh, to create a, a community uh, organization where only the, com the community itself will be involved in that so-called representatives of the community. We and want, uh, like I say, the bikers, the youth, the high schools. But what are you doing? What are, what are they going to be doing in the community? Uh, the, our purpose is to uh, like go up to, the, say, the school board, for example. We have a problem with San Bernardino School Board. You know, they won't listen to one individual, to one parent, to five parents. They'll listen to, they will listen to the whole community. So the object is to create change in the schools, right. create positive aspects yeah. for the Chicano community. Right. Going back to the school board, uh, if the school board sees, sees all, all the all these, the community itself, you know, the, the uh, like, you know, the spectrum of the, of the Chicano community, which it does have, you know, which he is a part. 
and the unified yes, Chicano right. community. And which we're doing right, what we're doing right now is under La Raza Unida banner, and that seems to be the party you know, of the future for the Chicano right now. You see that as, uh, as having great popularity in San Bernardino area, being able to solve some of the problems in the barrio? Uh, it's not the popularity, it's not a kick or anything like that. There's something serious that we have to get down to it. And the people realize this, the bikers, the students, the mothers, the fathers, the grandfathers even, and the grandmas realize that we are doing this. And in about a year or two, uh, people will be hearing about La Raza Unida. And uh, in the meantime, Paul, uh, how, how do you see involving the Chicano, the Chicano youth in this, in this particular uh, movement well, uh, to, well, to, to yeah. unite the, the older people with the youth? Well, that, that's a little bit hard right now because most of the people, when they think of a Chicano right now, uh, means a militant or it also means uh, a college student or something like this. Well, a Chicano at one time might have been this, might have been a cutthroat. A Chicano at one time might have been militant, but Chicano now is brotherhood and that's what the word means brotherhood and uh, the older people and i have spoken to people in the mid 40s uh, 50s and they're beginning to realize this and it's a slow thing that we have to go through but paul thank you very much thank you very much for your comments you're doing excellent work in the community thanks a lot okay. see you the committed chicano college student is still another type of personality he is more identified with Anglo culture than the Bato, but his commitment to solving problems in the barrio and legitimizing barrio culture in the academic community is no less intense. He is dedicated to employing his knowledge of the majority society to restructure the system and make it more open to the ideas that emanate from the barrio. He brings barrio life into the university classroom by helping to institute programs in Chicano studies. He tries to recruit more Chicano students and Chicano professors for his college or university. An example of great changes which have been made in the University of California system through these efforts will be explained by Dr. Alfredo Castaneda, Chairman of Mexican American Studies Program and Professor of Education at the University of California, Riverside. All right, thank you, Manuel. Uh, what we uh, try to do at the University of California, Riverside uh, campus in Chicano studies is basically three things. We try to recruit Mexican-American students from the various communities surrounding uh, the, the campus. And when they're brought on campus, we provide courses which help them in uh, finding out about themselves, their history, their background, their psychology, their sociology. At the second, at the sun, uh, also what we do in Chicano studies is provide factual information for all students, be he Anglo-American or, or what have you, so that uh, he doesn't have to persist with the stereotypes he has about the uh, Mexican-American. So the courses that we give are open not only to uh, Chicano students, but also to uh, all students who are interested. And the third thing we do is to help the rest of the university, the other departments like psychology, sociology, history, is help them recruit Mexican-American uh, professors who are qualified. In this way, we feel that Chicano studies is not an ethnic enclave, but a facility or a mechanism within the university where we encourage other departments to provide uh, courses and expertise and uh, research on Mexican-American affairs in general so that we ourselves in Chicano studies don't do all the teaching or all the uh, research but we're there to help the other parts of the university create and establish their own uh, expertise on Mexican-American affairs and I guess with that Manuel I think that covers the situation on the uh, University of California campus with the help of concerned college administrators, college students are starting to establish centers in the community which serve a variety of functions, from tutoring school children to disseminating information about poverty programs to teaching Chicano history and culture in prisons. A group of Chicanos of the second type we are discussing, students, will present their views. Dolores Alvarez from Pitzer College, Luis Mata from Pomona College are here today. Dolores, could you tell us about some of the work that you have been doing in trying to bring the university and the barrio closer together? Well, the university centers are known now to have a lot of resources. So like in the, in the Pomona Valley, some of the high school students walked out. And 
ourselves and students and faculty found ourselves being able to be committed to setting up a tutoring high school on a Saturday. And the most beautiful thing that's what's happened in, in um, Pomona Valley is that the students have been committed in coming. It's not just the faculty and the tutors, but it's the students who get up every morning at 8.30 and stay there for three hours till, till they're taken home at 12. And if they're not picked up, they call up and say, why wasn't I picked up this Saturday? Thank you very much, Lourdes. Uh, Luis, I know that you have been doing some work with the farm workers in the Coachella Valley. Could you tell us about some of that work? Uh, well, uh, one of the uh, most interesting jobs that I've done before I, in uh, Coachella Valley was um, that I was hired as a teacher in, um, in a private foundation program that, that was established there for about well, uh, it's been going on for a year now, and I've been, what I've, the kind of work that I did there was I, I instructed as a basic education teacher, and I worked on, uh, along with the, uh, with the Farm Workers Union in establishing um, more rapport between the, uh, between the Mexican American that, that lives in the community in Indio and Coachella Valley, and, uh, be, and also trying to, to uh, motivate the, uh, the Chicano people that stay back, uh, well, that stay in the, that uh, stay in that community to uh, help the farm workers uh, in their struggle to uh, to establish the union. Um, also, one of the one of the most recent things that I've been involved in the community uh, has been to um, establish core groups of Chicano parents to um, to go up to school boards and uh, and ask for their uh, their the right representation on uh, federally funded programs. On that is on advisory groups and also on, uh, on different types of programs that the school district has to offer the Chicanos. Thank you. There's uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk over with you, and that is that uh, I've heard that at the Claremont Colleges, both of you are involved in studying the possibilities of establishing a Chicano college as one of the group of Claremont Colleges. Dolores, could you tell me a bit about this? Well, for this summer, we'll have 12 students working on a feasibility and seeing what are the chances of such a college being established in Claremont and what would be the aims of a Chicano college. Would it be to perpetuate uh, elitist type of Chicanos or, or to build Chicanos that can actually go back to the Wadios and not be, you know, really different from the other people? And Luis? Uh, well, I think one of the main things that, you know, like I'd be, my function would be in, in establishing a Chicano college would be to, uh, for the college and administration to be uh, relevant to the needs of the community uh, around the area and also to establishing uh, students that will come out from the college to, uh, to go back to the barrios and go back to the school districts and establish a change that will benefit the entire community itself. And uh, what's, what's happening now is that during the summer that we'll be studying the feasibility of, of that type of institution being established as a as a totally independent institution from the rest of the of the Claremont colleges. I think I think to add would be, and we're also looking into the thing of training our, okay, who would be our uh, supportive services and who would be like non-academic staff. What kind of type of training programs do we offer the people, maybe who are maids, who are janitors, to know that they may rise also along with the students. Do you see only Chicano students coming to a college such as this? Well, or do you I, see it open to all students of all ethnic groups? I think uh, it, it can be open to all students of all ethnic uh, groups, but I think the main emphasis would be uh, for the college to uh, 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 instruct students from a uh, Mexican American background, which w would, would relate more to, to our people and would relate more to the problems that are occurring right now in the barrios. That would be certainly a very important function of such a college. Would have to be. And uh, if we could get the faculty and the students to work together, it would be a, a very, very effective function that it could serve. Uh, Dolores, what do you see in the area of early childhood education? Oh, I see a lot of positive things in that, uh, such as things coming out of the Cucamonga experiment and that students can uh, now, teachers can now use visual materials in which the Chicano is shown and the heritage materials I see as a positive. Thank you very much. It's been very nice to have you, Luis and Dolores. Mm -hmm. The new Chicana represents the third group of Mexican Americans who have achieved a new identity. She represents perhaps the greatest end result of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. She represents a varied group, the politician running for office, 
the woman leading the struggle of the farm workers and the girl of the brown berets. She is bringing to the movement the strength and also the tenderness which has for so long been hidden in the barrio. She is the backbone and the heart of the movement. The third group with us today, Chicanas, will discuss her involvement and participation in the movement. We have three Chicanas, two of whom are students at the University of California, Riverside. Esperanza Gomez, Mercedes Pais, and Vera Martinez. Esperanza, could you tell us uh, about some of the work that you have been doing uh, in the movement? Yes, I am the director of a teatro group, that's a theater group, and it consists mostly of high school and college Chicano youths from the barrio, and we are concerned mainly in dramatizing the problems that uh, we find that we're facing daily in El Barrio. And we have performed before various colleges and community groups and even some prisons. And we find that uh, this is a, an educational process for, well, not only for our audiences, but also for us. And it's an artistic endeavor, and it's also a political tool. Excellent. Mercy, uh, could you tell us about some of the work that you have been doing in the movement? Well, I work primarily with the Fintas throughout the Southwest, the uh, prisons. work with Chicano prisoners and drug addicts. And what I work in is part of a total movement throughout California and the Southwest to work in our prisons. The Chicano population in California and the prison system is about 58%. So a lot of our good people are in there. A lot of our potentials are in there. We have established, uh, with the help of the university, a series of classes in Chicano history, Chicano studies, political science, community involvement. We bring people from the community into La Pinta. Uh, we work with uh, anti-drug groups on the outside, Vala, Mayo, Empleo, Quebra. Vera, could you tell us about some of your experiences in trying to bring the community in, into um, the structure of the schools? Yes, very recently uh, I was involved in a uh, local high school blowout. Uh, there were some uh, high school students who were interested in getting the support of their parents because they were asking for specific changes within the schools. And uh, they were very anxious to explain what it was they wanted their parents to help them with. So uh, they came to the university and uh, a group of university students provided uh, resource information, uh, local st uh, statistics on dropout and uh, the percentage of Chicano teachers, uh, the fact that there were no Chicano studies programs in the high schools or in any of the elementary schools. So we were able to sort of provide a link between the high school students and their parents by providing uh, very needed factual information, which eventually, uh, in fact, right now up to the present, the uh, parents are involved and have uh, uh, they have their own group now that is uh, an advisory board that uh, supervises many of the uh, uh, many of the subjects and the needs of the uh, community through the schools. Uh, is uh, what what do all to any of, of the three of you? What, what do you see as the continuing role that the Chicana can play within the movement? Well. That Chicana is becoming uh, more involved. I think she's always been involved. She's probably becoming more obvious now. Uh, she has much to offer uh, because uh, she has an, an added uh, warmth that's instilled in La Familia. Uh, she is, can become involved in politics. She can become involved in education. And. Uh, I think she can provide a very unifying kind of uh, force for the movement, for anyone who is involved in the movement. Uh, she is really awakening to a new role, which uh, before was rather limited or stereotyped as just the family role. And I think she not only is awakening this feeling of involvement within herself, but also awakening other people to the fact that uh, she is very useful and can uh, provide a, um, a depth to, uh, to the movement. So you see a, uh, a manpower which has not been tapped before in the Chicano no, community? No, and it's very close to becoming uh, a very real thing now. I think it, uh, many of the men in the movement are realizing this and uh, are, are ready, I think, to take advantage of it. Thank you very much. It's been very nice to have you and continue you. your involvement in the community.
These three personalities, the Bato, the committed college student, and the Chicana, are beginning to work together to institute a new philosophy in education, one that believes in respecting the child's language and ethnic group, cultural democracy. Cucamonga, California is an example of their success. For years, the schools in Cucamonga rejected the culture of the Chicano barrio, ignoring its strengths and its problems. The barrio subsequently became a fertile ground for frustration and despair. Chicano children hardly ever completed high school. Chicano parents felt alienated from the school. In March 1969, the Cucamonga Upland chapter of the Mexican-American Political Association began an attempt to try and change all this. They encouraged three of their members to run for the school board. With the help of college students, Batos Locos, and Chicanas, they elected these candidates. Since then, they have made the Chicano parent, as well as the poor Anglo parent, active participants in the educational process. They have also instituted an innovative bicultural bilingual follow-through educational program which strives to promote understanding between the Anglo and Chicano communities. Cucamonga then is a perfect example of cultural democracy in action. In this program, we have tried to capture the spirit of the emerging Chicano. No more will the Chicano ask and wait. He will work within the system with his fellow Chicanos to achieve his goals. Following the words of Benito Juarez, quote, El respeto del derecho ajeno es la paz, unquote, translated, respect for the rights of others is peace. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. We have heard the voices of young Chicanos actively working to achieve that elusive goal of acculturation on their own terms. This is how some real Chicanos in the barrio think, act, and work. They want to be recognized as citizens of the United States and members of La Raza, that large percentage of American population united by heritage and cultural bonds who cherish their Mexican ancestry as too precious and universally valid to be abandoned. They want to share in the material benefits of the American technology at the same time, they want to maintain their concept of family, the dignity of the individual, the beauty of their Spanish language, and the right to be their own kind of American. Our next program will show how the media has perpetuated some demeaning Chicano stereotypes. Thank you.